Thank you, everyone. Thank you for staying with us um, at this time of the afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to be back in Jamaica. I joined this conference four years ago. That was pre-pandemic. Um, and it's really um, a good opportunity for us to know the developments that have been uh, going on in the Caribbean region, always uh, meeting with champions of Tibet in the Caribbean region also is, is very nice. Um, I would like to build on what my colleague Friedrich Hubler presented regarding the UNESCO um, global strategy for Tibet. Uh, regarding that, uh, I must say we have a, an important challenge on how to move from this vision because what uh, Friedrich actually presents is a vision for the future of Tibet that UNESCO is proposing to its member states. And, and how we move from this vision to actions and from those actions to actual transformation. The, um, the idea of this strategy is how to transform Tibet. It's called like that, transforming Tibet for successful transitions. And how to transition um, in, in those different areas that, that Friedrich was mentioning in terms of the economic recovery, but also how to address these other issues that are um, affecting the region in terms of, for example, the informal economy, which is very high in Latin America and the Caribbean, 53% of um, workers are in the informal economy. Um, there are some other issues, political issues that uh, Tibet also must uh, be aware of and, and think how to contribute to these um, problems that are causing, for example, a lot of people migrating from their countries and moving to other countries that receive them as professionals with some qualifications, but these qualifications sometimes can't be recognized because there are no uh, structures in place where uh, people can have uh, their, their competencies uh, recognized. So. Um, can we go to the first slide? Um, what we are doing now is work in progress, but we are thinking about how to transform Tibet in the region based on this vision that UNESCO is proposing. Um, these are some references that we are taking. There are many reports and many diag diagnostics in terms of uh, the, the economic, the political, and the social situation of countries in the Caribbean and Latin America. Uh, we also have several national plans and strategies and policies already developed. There is a lot of progress made by member states in terms of developing their own vision. So I think it's, uh, it's also important how to connect this national vision and also the regional vision. We have several um, regional organizations like CARICOM, for example, that has developed a, a regional vision for Tibet in the Caribbean, and we have similar uh, structures, for example, in Central America, in South America. So these are all um, elements that are important to consider. And there are several reports on what's happening, uh, what are the issues on Tibet in the region. There are some regional experiences also that we can look at. For example, of course, there is a regional strategy uh, from the European Union, from the CARICOM, from ASEAN in Asia, from the African Union. And if we look at them, we can take some, um, some lessons from, from these um, strategies. One is, for example, to recognize the diversity. We are looking at countries that are very diverse, that have very different um, backgrounds in terms of education, but also in terms of Tibet, and this is important to consider. There is a need for a common language on Tibet. Um, what is Tibet is understood in a different ways in different countries, so we need to um, understand these, uh, these differences to understand what we are talking about when we talk about Tibet. Um, and also contextualize action. Sometimes um, it's important to consider the needs of the particular territories and that Tibet actually responds to those needs. Um, also, in developing the Tibet training programs, it's important to have a structure that allows to organize and, and classify and link these training programs so that people can access this training and build um, a career and, and a, a career path uh, within that structure. Uh, another lesson from all these different strategies is the need for social dialogue in Tibet. We need to have stakeholders, the government, the private sector, uh, workers' representatives, and others. Also, I think particularly the universities in terms of knowledge generation is very important and is one of the 
weaknesses in a region. There is very little knowledge generation in Tibet. There is uh, much more work to be done in terms of research in Tibet. I know in Jamaica um, there are very good researchers and that, that's a strength that I think it's important to value. Um, but there are some other stakeholders uh, to involve. Um, also, the focus on particular groups of beneficiaries, especially young people and women that were very much affected during the pandemic um, in terms of employment and in, in terms of training. So uh, these are uh, priorities for UNESCO. And also the, the migrants. Uh, like I said before, there is a lot of uh, movement in the region in terms of groups of people going to different countries. And we need to address this issue in terms of how to recognize their skills and how to uh, support these people in entering the labor market. Um, and also, of course, the uh, rural population. And also always, uh, and it's mentioned in, in all the regional strategies, the need for appropriate budget. Investment in TIVA needs to be um, sufficient uh, to cover what this um, kind of training and education needs. TIVA is an expensive um, way of providing education. We need to cover expenses for facilities and teachers and, and, and all that needs to be considered uh, in terms of investment. Sometimes uh, the national budget for education is not enough to guarantee quality TVET, so that is one of the challenges. And, and many countries have um, developed different approaches on how to solve this. So I will mention just a very few of the common challenges that we found are facing TVET in, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I will mention, uh, these are things that are mentioned in all the TVET strategies that we have reviewed from Mexico through Central America, the Caribbean, and South America. Um, there are, for example, problems with readiness. People have very low basic skills in math, in um, reading, uh, language, and, and science, which are uh, prerequisites to start a TV training and to guarantee that the TV training is actually um, a contribution. So that, that's one of the, the things we found. Uh, the, um, the career guidance structures are also important. Some countries have established these career guidance structures that allow um, kids in schools, for example, to discover their vocation, discover the talents they have for the future, what kind of career they can pick when they uh, enter the labor market. So these structures are there in some countries and others are still weak. So this, I think this is uh, important. And also the staff qualification. Um, we see, for example, there's a lot of concerns on, on the qualification of teachers. Um, but not just teachers, it was mentioned before in the previous session also the, about the leaders, how to better prepare uh, TVET leaders to better uh, manage TVET institutions, um, how to better prepare other supporting staff that, um, that uh, training centers need, for example. And so when we're talking about the staff qualification, we're looking at all staff that are part of the TVET system and the need to be qualified to um, provide quality TVET training. Um, you will see some of these issues probably uh, reflected in what uh, the reality of Jamaica and other Caribbean countries are. Yes. This is the vision that we're trying to um, promote in the region. Um, we think that TVET uh, should be transformed to respond to, co to individual needs economic development and social aspiration. I think it's important to stress that because the new TVET strategy from UNESCO um, is oriented towards sustainable development. And when we talk about TVET for sustainable development, we think of TVET not just um, regarding its traditional role on developing um, skills to uh, promote the economy or productivity, but there are also some other elements to consider. And one of the elements is the individual. How to promote um, better persons that are happier with their lives, that are accomplished, um, that can contribute to their society. So that's one aspect of, of TVET that is included in this new strategy that goes beyond the 
more traditional economic perspective of Tibet. And the other aspect that is included in this strategy is the social contribution of Tibet. How do we um, take advantage of Tibet programs to respond to the needs of society? Each country and each society uh, has their own expectations, what kind of citizens uh, we, we want for the future of the country, or how to build more pacific, uh, more peaceful societies, more uh, just societies. Uh, all these issues um, are included uh, in the new strategy, especially, for example, uh, gender equality or inclusion. Um, these are all priorities now in the new strategy. So we have this three-fold perspective where we uh, still consider that the contribution to the economic development is important in Tibet, but we also need that it's important to stress uh, how Tibet contributes to the individual in terms of its uh, their own expectations for the future and how they contribute to the social justice and more peaceful uh, life together. Uh, these are the, uh, the main points here. We can go to the next. And based on, on that vision, we think that uh, the main goal of, of building a framework for action in the region is how to uh, contribute, how can UNESCO contribute um, to strengthen Tibet in member states in Latin America and the Caribbean in line with our global strategy, but especially consider the particular characteristics of the region and also as a way to promote acceleration to, towards the uh, 2030 education agenda. This is the main, the main goal. Okay, there are six areas, um, six strategic objectives that are at the same time areas of action. Um, the first is to promote access. We think there is much, eff much more effort to be done in terms of expanding access to Tibet. Um, for example, like I said before, um, young women, uh, young people, women, and members of vulnerable uh, groups, and this can be done through more flexible and uh, diverse and territorialized training uh, provision. Uh, another way uh, to go in the region is to support the provision of lifelong learning opportunities. And this lifelong learning perspective is a um, particular characteristic of all the uh, UNESCO, all what UNESCO is working on right now. And in terms of TVET, that means how can we make sure uh, from a lifelong learning perspective that these, um, this kind of area is worked on very early, from very early in schooling. So I like what Professor Morris said before about broadening the scope of TVET to include pre-elementary, elementary, secondary education, because we need to start talking about um, TVET very early to develop the vocation, to develop the skills uh, children and need to develop for their future careers in, in different uh, Tibet areas. So this is a very important point, how to build these um, structures for, for lifelong learning. And, and also think about um, the future of war. It is expected that people are going to uh, change much more the kind of jobs they are doing because the labor market is also changing very fast. So the need for reskilling and upskilling is going to be there all the time and the lifelong learning perspective of Tibet is also um, considering that, how to promote um, opportunities for reskilling and upskilling people. Uh, another area is um, pre-service and in-service training of Tibet staff. Uh, UNESCO is very interested right now in Tibet teachers because this is a group of teachers that is not very visible in, in terms of uh, research in terms of recognition, so we need to make the, the issues and the problems that we see um, regarding Tibet teachers more visible in the region. Right now we are conducting uh, a regional study on Tibet teacher. Jamaica is a case uh, study for us. And we are trying to find out uh, what are the main, um, the main issues and, and also what are the uh, the conditions, the, um, and, and how we can build these um, partnerships and collaboration to address these issues um, and, and building these platforms. 
so this is uh, an area an area of interest i think uh, teacher tibet leaders is also another area an important area of uh, possible collaboration then we have um, the governments and financing models for tibet that's uh, that's another thing that is uh, we see as an interest in the in the region in many countries so how to strengthen governance how to um, find new financing models for tibet um, then quality assurance is another concern there are many countries uh, which uh, don't have quality established quality assurance mechanisms and those who have quality assurance mechanisms sometimes need to review or strengthen their structures. So this is another area that, that we are going to be working on. And the last one uh, has to do with the emerging topics and these new priorities that are, um, uh, are we are seeing these like such as uh, innovation, uh, digitalization of Tibet, and, and other areas of interest. So we can go through this uh, very quickly, how to increase access to Tibet. We have several ways uh, that we are doing that, but I want to focus on the last point because I think it was mentioned before, how we improve the image of Tibet. That's an important point. There is a social perception that Tibet is a kind of education that is not as good as the traditional academic uh, path. So what is the cause of that? Why is um, what is the, the history behind that, and how can we address this kind of social perception of Tibet? Uh, in that line, we're trying to build uh, links between uh, Tibet and higher education or universities, um, and we are trying to connect these two structures so that can uh, these exchanges and collaboration can improve that uh, that image. We can go to the next. I will just take one of each one. Um, how to create lifelong learning opportunities. Uh, we think there are a lot of opportunities with what was addressed today about uh, micro certifications and this more flexible kind of, of new um, delivery methods. Uh, so these are opportunities that we can take advantage of. Um, in terms of pre-service and in-service training, uh, we need to improve work conditions. There is a lot of uh, difficulties right now um, in terms of retention of teachers because we need to remember that teachers besides being teachers are also professionals in other areas and they are, there's always a competing uh, situation with the labor market and uh, usually these professionals have better opportunities in their professions so it's difficult to retain them so we need to find strategies to improve work conditions so that this leads to a better retention level. Um, strengthening pre-service teacher training and also in-service teacher training are two uh, chal additional challenges in this area. Funding mechanisms, I think there are several lessons that we can learn from, from many countries, how they manage, but I, I think it's important to take one of the things that Dr. Ali said today about decolonization. We have a lot of experience uh, in the region importing models from countries that have developed this model based on particular conditions. These models are successful in those countries because there are certain conditions for that. And when we don't have those conditions, then it's very difficult to have the same level of success. So we, I think we need to develop the ability to develop, to produce models that are contextualized, that are responding to the particular uh, characteristics of the labor market, of the local culture, and that can be as successful. We can learn from those experiences, but we also need uh, to develop this capacity to produce our own models. If you have interest, all this information is available um, online and will be also available through uh, the site of the conference later, so we can, you can access to that. We can move. Well, I just want to focus on this one because um, as UNESCO, we need strategic partnerships to achieve these uh, objectives. And we have several assets in the organization, and I want to mention some of them. UNESCO Univo is our specialized center for TVET that is always assisting in terms of uh, technical capacity. So that's something that we can uh, count on in our efforts to strengthen TVET in our member states. 
but we also have a, an international institute for educational planning at UNESCO. They are specialized in uh, strategies, policies, planning, and, and they can provide support in that area. We also have a um, specialized institute for higher education. They are also very interested in Tibet in higher education. We are working with, with this uh, institute, it's called ESAT. Um, we also have an institute for lifelong learning where they are focusing more on, on how to address young and adult people and all these non-formal training provision of TVET because we are um, sometimes very focused on formal TVET, but there is also a very important structure of non-formal TVET in many countries. So the, the UIL, the, the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, is very focused on that. They work very much on recognition of prior learning, for example. They have some guidelines developed for RPL, um, and they have very good experience on that. The UNESCO Institute for Statistics can help us to strengthen our data. This is, like I said, this is one of the weaknesses in the region. There is little data um, for decision making in Tibet. We need to strengthen statistics. We need to strengthen um, methods of collecting data so that having this data available will allow us to make better decisions. And uh, we believe that the UNESCO Institute of Statistics uh, is important in that area. We have a Latin American laboratory for education quality, which is also doing some studies in the region for quality in education. Uh, we have a specialized institute for uh, ICT in education, which is also one of the um, trending topics right now, the artificial intelligence and digitalization of TVs are two main areas. And finally, we have, um, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have 10 different offices that are uh, working with, with member states. So all of this uh, is what UNESCO has as a, as a structure to support uh, the implementation of the strategy. And also, of course, governments, international organization, I need to mention that there are many efforts to strengthen TVET. You know ILO, you know OAS, you know international agencies of cooperation such as the Japanese, the German, the, um, the, there are several countries that are supporting uh, TVET. And we need to align somehow those efforts. Otherwise, sometimes we see that some initiatives are overlapping and, and we uh, don't have a common framework for action. I think that's important uh, to look at the um, opportunities we have with this cooperation with international organization and agencies, but also that we can have a particular framework that can align all these opportunities and we can build these synergies in different projects. Uh, we need the, the support from universities, like I said, in terms of knowledge generation. There is a lot of research to be done. Uh, civil society also, there, there is a lot of um, opportunity in terms of projects by the civil society, the private sector, of course. We need to have more involvement from the private sector in TIVA, not just in terms, I know that there are many countries in the region that have a, a, a levy system where the private sector supports TIVA. But I think that is not enough. We need to have the private sector committed to TVET in other areas as well. So, and, and these areas um, are being um, worked on in several countries. Uh, how uh, creative and innovative we can be in terms of involving the private sector in TVET. Not just to provide funding, but also provide technical capacity, provide experts, and, and also some other uh, areas where they can collaborate. And also the media, we have a problem of the image of Tibet. Perhaps we need a better communication strategy. How do we um, do the marketing of Tibet? How do we convince society that this is actually an opportunity for people to grow? And I think that part of the communication strategy is an important element that probably is not uh, present right now in many countries. And well, and, and this is just to close my presentation, just what we are considering um, important point, building strategic partnerships. We need to bring together people that are um, willing to champion for Tibet and are going to be able to collaborate. We need to, some of the lessons that we've learned from, from the pandemic, from the COVID pandemic, is that we are strong when we are together and we collaborate. 
and this is also the case for TV. So these strategic partnerships are uh, critical to accomplish our goal. Then comes the funding and, and a good implementation plan and an information and communication and the, the monitoring evaluation. But the, I, I think the core element here is how do we build uh, these strategic partnerships. Thank you very much for the time and patience and uh, we'll keep discussing about the future of Tibet. <laughs>